Sean, I think you're muted. I am muted. <laughs> I made a rookie mistake. Good evening. Welcome to People's University. Live stream. Bugs and people. I will start over. Uh, sorry about that. Just a couple of announcements before I get to our guests for this evening. This is our third class in this series, Bugs and People. You're in the right place. I made the rookie mistake. Okay. Next Tuesday, June 15 at noon, A.C. Grayling, a philosopher from the United Kingdom, will be here live from his home in the United Kingdom at noon our time. His book is called Frontiers of Knowledge. He is what is known as a polymath, which means he basically knows everything. And he's going to tell us what he knows. And that'll be noon on Tuesday, the 15th. Next Thursday on June 17th at 6.30 p.m., uh, we will continue this series, People's University, Bugs and People, with an inordinate fondness for beetles with Dr. Arthur Evans, who is a professor of biology and a, a beetle aficionado and expert. Okay, uh, tonight, if you ask a question of our instructor or make a comment, you'll be entered into a drawing at the end to win either one of these Brood PU t-shirts or the Brood PU tote bag. Your choice. We'll do two giveaways at the end. So that's an incentive for you to ask a question. And uh, if you want to see the full program, go to the library's website and search bugs. And if you want to win the cicada art that Bob Villa Magna made, I've been showing you how nice it is. Uh, all you have to do is go and cicada yourself at the library, take a selfie, post it with hashtag brood PU. You know the drill. Come on out, humiliate yourself for the library and we will reward you with cool prizes. Okay, enough of that. Now, our instructor this evening is Elizabeth Rowan. She grew up in Santa Cruz, California and got a BA in biology at Wellesley College. After graduating, she did an internship at the Bureau of Land Management in Bishop, California, collecting native seeds for restoration projects. She earned her master's in entomology at Purdue under the supervision of Dr. Ian Kaplan. And she studied uh, volatiles and tomato defenses against Manduca sexta. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She then moved uh, to the Pennsylvania State University to do a PhD in entomology with Dr. John Tooker. She studied the effects of soil management techniques, tillage, fertilizers, crop, uh, cover crops, etc., and on herbivores and their predators. She is now a service assistant professor at West Virginia University in the Division of Plant and Soil Science, where she works with the Insect Zoo, which is a very cool concept, and other outreach activities. She teaches entomology and researches the connections between insects, plants, and soil. She's going to tell us about grasshoppers and other stuff and evolution. Here is Elizabeth Rowan. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction. I um, That pretty much covered my first slide. Um, I have been really enjoying this series so far. I've been to the last two and it's been uh, very interesting and I'm excited that I get to participate in it tonight. So tonight I'm gonna be talking a little bit about insect evolution, some of the big concepts and sort of the history, where, what the earth looked like when insects were evolving. And then we'll talk about Orthoptera, uh, the um, grasshoppers kick it, crickets and katydids, um, among other um, smaller, more less diverse orders. First, I want to uh, start by uh, talking a little bit about who I am. Um, so as Sean mentioned, I am um, a service assistant professor at WVU. Um, I coordinate the insect zoo. So um, we're not traveling right now, but during uh, on a normal under normal situations, uh, without COVID, we would be um, out doing programs, um, especially with kids handling insects. We go to the uh, West Virginia, oh my gosh, my slides are just here, getting away from me, uh, do programs at the state fair. You may have interacted with the insect zoo. We're trying to work on uh, a more robust online presence to get more sort of um, do-it-yourself outdoor activities with, with, um, with insects in your backyard. Um, among, I do have the slides running and they are. Yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, they're not showing. To share my screen again. <laughs> oh my goodness. 
share. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, so um, we do lots of activities with the insect zoo. Um, that's something of interest. Hopefully we'll be able to travel again. Feel free to contact me. Um, I also teach an introductory entomology and insect ecology for WVU. Um, and my research is really focusing on the connections between soil and plants um, and herbivores and how things like fertilizers and manure and cover crops can affect um, herbivores from sort of their plants and then also from above from their predators or putting pressure on both sides to try to control pest outbreaks. Today we're not going to talk about soil or any of that. Um, I'm going to tell you some stories about insect evolution um, and then we're going to talk about um, Orthoptera and I've got a few interesting stories about Orthoptera including um, locusts. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about um, identifying different groups of orthopterans um, and some resources that you can use to, to identify anything, uh, any local uh, grasshoppers and katydids and crickets that you find. But because we're going to talk about evolution, I want to just talk briefly about what evolution is. So evolution is defined as the change in allele, allele frequency in a population. So allele frequency is basically the amount of the number of or the different variations of particular features. So for example, eye color or hair color would be um, a blonde hair would be allele, an allele of uh, of hair color, right? Um, so that really happens first of all on an individual level. So we have um, as cells multiply, as you get more cells, they have to re um, copy DNA, uh, which is the building block for all these other proteins that that cells use. So um, as DNA is copied, there can be some um, copying errors, just like if you accidentally put two things in the copying machine and got something you didn't want, right? So you can get sort of problems with an individual nucleotide being miscopied. Um, you can have whole sections of DNA that kind of get misplaced and copied somewhere where they're not supposed to be. And for individual cells, this means maybe that the, that cell dies because it doesn't have the right DNA. When it happens in the gametes, in the sperm and egg, um, it gets passed on to the next generation. And so you get copying errors that might um, result in something like blue eyes cicadas. Um, it's just a, a mutation that, that and an allele in the cicada population um, that's slightly different. And so populations with more and more blue-eyed cicadas, you would be considering evolving. So how does, um, how, what does this mean on a population level? We're really interested here in how many copies of this mutation of these different alleles are there in a population. And there's a couple of different ways in which this can occur. So if you've heard of Darwin's theory of natural selection, that's sort of the one that we think of the most often, um, where you have mutation that creates variation in this population. Some of those mutations are good, like these, these gray ones, and some of the mutations are bad and they're selected against, and those die off. So maybe it's that, you know, that individual doesn't even make it past, you know, the, the uh, doesn't make it past hatching or or being uh, or or uh, being birthed, and sometimes it means that they don't reproduce or they get eaten by a predator more quickly. Um, from those mutations, you know the ones that survive will reproduce, and there will be more mutations, and those will accumulate over time. Some of them will be successful, some of them won't be. And as they reproduce over time, the allele frequency in that population changes quite dramatically. So you can see this final population looks very different from that initial individual. Um, and that initial individual population didn't have the same sort of genetics, the same allele frequency as the original. So that's how natural selection 
would lead to a change in allele frequency over time. But there are some other ways in which um, natural, or not natural selection, but, but a, the, the genetic makeup of a population can change. For example, if you have one population on a mainland, say of cicadas, and a hurricane comes through and blows um, a subgroup of those populations onto an island, um, and they sort of take over that island, they, they, they colonize that island. But that pop initial population of cicadas was 50% blue-eyed cicadas just by random chance. That's gonna be a very different population than the original source. Um, and it's gonna have a different allele frequency. It's gonna be slightly different evolutionarily. And over time, those, it, it's, those are gonna accumulate in a different way. We call that genetic drift. It's not because of something inherent um, that allows that population to reproduce more, that those individuals to reproduce more. It was just random chance that they ended up somewhere on an island and um, it has nothing to do with how fit they are. The last way in which we see these differences, these changes in allele frequency in the population is gene flow. So if you have, say, that island population with more blue-eyed cicadas moving back onto the mainland, they would be bringing more of those um, blue-eyed genes into that population and changing the frequency of blue eyes in the original population. And we, we see this um, particularly important when we think about insecticide resistance. Um, there's some insects that you spray pesticides on and only some survive because they have a particular mutation, but then those insects might be traveling to different locations. So um, we see it with, with a mosquito populations that they get become, some populations become resistant to insecticides because when you're trying to control mosquitoes and then moving and bringing those mutations to new populations and making those new populations insecticide resistant. And so it's an important source of, of um, evolution, but it's not because of natural selection in the new population, but in the old one. So over time, these mutations, these changes in alleles over in, in a population accumulate and they accumulate. And we can track differences between groups by using the accumulated differences in their DNA. We can see them in their morphological characters. For example, the presence of a jaw or the presence of hair for mammals. Um, and groups that have more similar characteristics, more similar DNA, are more likely to have shared a more recent common ancestor. So things like crocodiles and birds here share a more recent common ancestor than birds do with lizards or turtles or mammals. Um, and, and we understand that because they have more shared characteristics, more shared DNA. Um, we visualize this using what's called phylogenetic trees, where we're basically grouping things by how similar they are to try to understand how recently they had a common ancestor. Often we see these pictures of evolution, and I wanna make a point quickly here, which is we often think of evolution as something linear, going from chimps to humans, or um, from, you know, Columbula, like very simple insects to beetles, right? There's some sort of pinnacle or goal to evolution. And in reality, um, the divergence of species is not really linear, but a series of, of splits over time that can happen more or less rapidly, that one side of the split may survive and reproduce more or less. Um, but it, it's there's no sort of goal, right? In the case of insects, insects are particularly diverse because they have split a lot of times and those splits have continued to survive. They still exist. Um, insects are the most diverse group of organisms alive on Earth. Um, there are just over one million species of described insects, but there are likely between four and five million undescribed species, which means that there are only um, 20 to 25 percent of the diversity we've described. We don't even know what's out there still. So where do insects fit into the tree of life? 
Um, insects are in the kingdom Animalia. They are animals. Um, and within that group, they are part of the phylum Arthropoda. So if you see here, Arthropoda is sister to Nematoda. So nematodes, they share a common ancestor. And we have to go back pretty far to get them to see how they're related to chordates or, or um, animals with a backbone like mammals, birds, fish, blizzards, all of that belongs in chordates. So, so that group and arthropods are at the, a similar taxonomic level. If we look even further into the phylum arthropoda, arthropods share a number of common features. They have segmented bodies, they have a chitinous exoskeleton, and they have segmented appendages. So um, insects and say uh, millipedes or centipedes share a common ancestor that was an arthropod. And um, all of these groups, myriapods, millipedes, centipedes, the trilobites, um, Calicerates like uh, spiders, ticks, mites, scorpions are all, and um, crustaceans are all arthropods. And in fact, crustaceans and insects uh, are more closely related, we think, than these other groups. Um, insects are thought to be uh, part, like one particular branch of, of a group called pan crustacea. Um, most crustaceans have two pairs of legs. Um, per segment. This is sometimes lost after the fact. They have four antennae, not two antennae. They have compound eyes. They're mostly found in the ocean, but one group has emerged um, onto land, um, and that is the insects. And insects have three body segments. They have external mouth parts. They have six legs, and they often have wings. And in fact, insects are the only group in arthropods that have wings. So if you see uh, an arthropod with wings is definitely an insect. So where do insects come from? How did, what, when and how did they evolve? So let's start by thinking about the crustacean common ancestor. It lived in the ocean. Um, it lived among other arthropods that were also in the ocean, like myriapods, so millipedes and centipedes and spiders and ticks and those groups diverge from crustacea underwater in the ocean um, and, and those came out onto land separately from from the um, ancestor the, those more recent ancestors of insects so as the seas receded there was more fresh water um, a group of crustaceans moved into fresh water um, those split into the brachiopods. So brachiopods are things like if you've ever raised sea monkeys, that's a brachiopod that then moved from freshwater back into the ocean, into, into, um, into salt water. From there, during the Silurian, the, um, a group moved more onto land. This was the hexapods. Um, the challenge with moving from fresh water to land is how do you stay hydrated? And water is so important for all aspects of uh, cell life that it's really tough to, to hold the water in. And so these, in, these first land dwelling insects or hexapods had a really hard time retaining their humidity. And so um, hexapods like columbola, springtails and protrusions you'll find in soil, um, they need that humidity to, to survive. Uh, as hexapods diversified, um, they evolved the ability, there's some cute waxes that they have on their, um, on their bodies, on their eggs, that helps retain moisture. And that's super important for the success of insects is their ability to retain moisture because it means that they don't just have to live near fresh water, near the soil. They can um, live in very dry environments like desert. Uh, they can live uh, in Antarctica. They Anywhere you can think of, there are, there are insects. So what did the earth first look like for um, the first insects? So we're talking just after the Silurian, right? They've just come up onto land. Um, they're starting to, to, to diversify. We have early, um, these sort of early groups like columbola, like um, silverfish. Um, 
living among primitive rooted plants that were also colonizing land. Um, the uh, descendants of these early primitive plants include horsetails and lycophytes, ferns, mosses, things that um, have a very simple vascular system. And the world was pretty warm. The average temperature on Earth was about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. As plants sort of got bigger and started doing more and more photosynthesis, they sucked up some of the CO2 that was creating this really warm environment and um, actually cooled temperature of the Earth quite significantly. So, so over this um, 100 million year period, the Earth tended to be got cooler and there was more and more oxygen in the atmosphere, which is really important uh, for the next um, sort of era, the Carboniferous. The Carboniferous um, it was a period in which plants got very large. There were these huge fern tree forests um, that were doing a lot of photosynthesis. They were um, incorporating a lot of carbon into their plant tissues, exhaling oxygen and dying and just staying on the soil surface because they weren't decomposing. There wasn't a robust decomposer community. The fungi and bacteria and insects that do a lot of decomposition hadn't evolved yet. So the, the CO2 wasn't being, or the carbon wasn't being re-released into the atmosphere as CO2. And in fact, it was staying on the, soils, on the surface of the earth and getting compressed and compressed. And it's the reason we have coal, coal deposits in this uh, across, you know, Appalachia is because it used to be a swamp that didn't decompose. The result of having 35% oxygen in the atmosphere meant that insects could get huge. So um, the griffin fly, which is what this fossil is, was probably about half a meter long, it was about this big. Uh, it was foot, a foot and a half in wingspan. Um, this picture you can see shows the uh, size of a modern dragonfly compared to the griffin fly that evolved during the Carboniferous. And it is, it's massive, it's hu a huge difference. Um, this, the reason, there's a couple of hypotheses for why insects were able to get so big. And um, one really important one is that insects use a passive diffusion system to breathe. So they have holes in the side of their abdomen that just allows air to come in and out. And uh, it's not super efficient if you're really big. So you need more uh, oxygen in the atmosphere to be able to, to basically to breathe and, and, and um, fly and things like that. There have been a couple of modern day experiments with increasing the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere and seeing how insects do. And, and insects that grow with more oxygen tend to be bigger, even now. So um, we're gonna skip forward a couple hundred million years and talk about the, crustate, the Cretaceous. So, Think about all of the dinosaurs, and this is right um, right before all of the dinosaurs go extinct. But there is these these beautiful swamps, lots of of diversity. There's lots of plant diversity. We're starting to see trees. But what's really important about this period is that we get a huge explosion of plant diversity, and you can see this here in this period. We have this radiation of angiosperms. And it's associated with active pollination and, and uh, pollinators and pl the evolution of pollinators and plants together really creates this um, huge explosion of diversity within plants and within insects. So the first pollinators, this was um, a, a scorpion fly, a mycoptera. Um, it was identified as one of the first pollinators probably about 160 million years ago. But I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave you with this, but I'm going to ask you this question and we'll spend about, think about it for about 15 seconds and I'll, uh, I'll explain why pollination was so important to the diversity of plants and insects. 
So why would insects carrying pollen result in a lot of species? So if you think about how species diverge, they have to not be reproducing with you know, their sister group. There has to be separation. So if you have pollinators that carry pollen to and between species and um, you know, either the flowers change in, in shape um, or the color or something, and they, the pollinators aren't moving those pollen grains to different species anymore, that's sort of the reproductive isolation. That keeps one set of plants from pollinating with another set of plants. And so you get sort of the separation of, of, of plant life, uh, of plant species, because they're not reproducing with each other and, and differences can kind of accumulate that way. The pollinator, if it's not, if it's being rewarded for only going to these flowers, or if there's some reason that it is now only attracted to these flowers, or it can only eat this pollen because the chemicals in the, the nectar, the pollen are somehow different and it has separated from other groups of, uh, you know, other parts of its population within the same species and is now only using these, then it's maybe not interacting with, reproducing with the other part of the population that's dealing with these flowers, right? So, so those two things go together because it's the food source is such an important source for diversity and for isolation and, and the reproduction is so important for isolation. So we have kind of, uh, these two things that go hand in hand with each other that can help that, that lead to um, a more diverse plant life and a more diverse insect life. Which leads us to today. Um, so as I mentioned, there are about 1 million described insect species. There are probably four to 5 million insect species total. Um, many of, most of which have not been described. This um, graph shows the diversity of insects across uh, all of the different insect orders. So here we have beetles are about 40% of described insect species. Um, wasps and bees are about 13%. Flies are about 12%. Um, moths and butterflies are about 16%. And then everything else fits within these categories. And you'll see here, this is called holometabola. These are insects that go undergo complete metamorphosis. That means they have an egg, larvae, pupae, and adult stage. And the really critical thing about holometabola that's different from incomplete metamorphosis or hemimetabola is it means that you can separate the larvae from the adults completely. So they can have completely different shapes, um, you know, look, think about a caterpillar versus a butterfly. Those are going to use completely different resources, feed on completely different foods. You think about a mosquito. The mosquito larvae live in water. The adults fly around. There's all kinds of examples of how holometabolous insects can use not just one really particular resource, but two really particular resources or two very general resources. Um, and that has contributed enormously to their diversity. But today we are going to talk about a hemimetabolous insect uh, group, the Orthoptera. Uh, so the orth Orthoptera, um, the common ancestor of Orthoptera, or the first Orthoptera emerged during the Carboniferous, so during those enormous forests with lots of um, oxygen. There are currently about 28,000 described species of Orthoptera. To give you a sense of context, there are um, 6,500 species of ant of, of mammal, so uh, less than a, a fourth of the number of described species of mammal compared to the number of grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Um, there are 
5,000 species of dragonfly. So you were talking about Hemiptera with the cicadas last week. There are 80,000 species of cicadas and the super diverse beetle family has 350,000 current described species. So that's almost 10 times, more than 10 times as many as Orthoptera. Um, Orthoptera have uh, many different feeding abilities. So most are herbivores. Um, there are some omnivores, which means they eat both animal and plant tissue. And then there are some predators. So there's some katydid predators that like, eat um, eggs and, and other smaller um, insects. This group is defined by its jumping hind legs. You can see that in all of these pictures, these, these big hind legs, they also sing to attract mates. And singing um, is a really great way to recognize species. So many, um, of these organisms or these, this group has either um, sort of these combs on its legs or on their wings that they rub together to create these really particular sounds. And they pick them up with um, organs called tympana. So katydids, for example, have their tympana on their legs. Um, crickets have them on their bodies. And I'm gonna play you a couple of songs just to, so you can hear the diversity of these, these songs um, within something that looks really similar to each other. So let's see if I can do this. Okay. So um, there's this really great website um, that will teach you to identify different songs of insects in the area. And you can go and play all of these different songs. And I'm just gonna demonstrate a little bit what those sounds sound like. So can you hear that? Well, I hope you can. So these different crickets that are all very similar looking to each other have completely different songs. All right, so that just gives you um, a little bit of a sense of what the, how different these different songs can be. And really it helps these crickets find each other, the, or not just crickets, but all of these different organisms find each other. Oops. Um, so that they can, they can recognize them and mate and, um, you know, find females. Unfortunately, like anything, there is a downside to being loud and to making a recognizable noise. Um, there are predators and parasitoids. So, um, organisms that lay their eggs inside of another, uh, inside of an insect and, their larvae sort of grow and eat them from the outs inside out. So this field cricket has a song that is recognized by the females, but is also recognized by this Ormia tachinid fly. So the fly will zoom in on that sound, lay an egg probably right about here. That egg will hatch and burrow into the cricket um, and start feeding and eating on this cricket from the inside until these larvae sort of are as big as the cricket's body and they burst out, pupate, and turn into adults. Which is if you're a cricket, is kind of sucks. It kind of sucks for the cricket. So um, there are particular populations that have been studied in Kauai in Hawaii that have stopped singing. They've evolved 
to recognize other features and not the song. They don't sing anymore. So uh, in normal populations, when there are no flies, these crickets will sing um, and they'll be happy. But if there are flies, they, the flies will lay their eggs and the crickets will all be dead. So it's really put a strong selective pressure to not sing so that the flies can't find the crickets. And they have other cues that they can rec that the females can recognize to find the males. But it's not quite as efficient as those songs. So if there are no flies, the male crickets don't survive and don't reproduce. So we have some populations that are loud, and those are the populations that, where the flies are absent, and some populations that are mute, that don't sing, where the flies are present. So um, everything is a trade-off. Uh, these, um, the parasitoid flies are not the only predator that Orthoptera have to worry about. Um, and there are particularly katydids that have evolved really interesting and intricate ways of hiding on their plants. So, um, there are some, uh, katydids that, that feed and live on this, on this sort of, um, moss that have evolved these very characteristic and, 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 and interesting um, crypsis so that they're camouflaged against that moss. See the same thing on this leaf. And then this is a familiar face around here. Um, this, this Katie did in particular looks like a leaf and we see it all the time it comes to lights. What predators do you think that they're avoiding? That are super visual. They're going to cue in on on these visual cues if they stand out against the background. Yeah. So, birds, birds, birds love to eat insects, and they have really good eyes. And so, it's probably bird predation that is driving a lot of this crypsis, a lot of these this camouflage. Okay. So my last story about Orthoptera this evening um, is a pretty relevant one these days, um, but it's been relevant for a really long time. Um, so uh, there are stories about locust plagues as far as, you know, in the Bible. And, um, you know, we may have mentioned, was mentioned last week that some people call cicadas locusts. Um, but locusts are really a kind of grasshopper. They're a social grasshopper and they're social. There's some species of grasshoppers that morph into cicadas when they get into really crowded situations. So this is a desert locust in its solitary phase. It's brown and kind of drab. And it turns out it has a lot of hairs on its legs and on its thorax and on its face that react to touching other uh, desert locusts. So they, they have a little bit, they have sort of, um, uh, they have a personal bubble, you would say. And when other locusts or other grasshoppers start pushing into them, over time, the females will lay eggs that produce a, uh, of the, the, the gregarious, phenotype, the, the sort of social butterfly grasshopper that loves to be with other grasshoppers. And these are physiologically different from the solitary locust. They are, they eat a ton more. They have sort of bigger muscles. They fly more and faster. They have interestingly shorter wings, but they are better flyers. Um, and they are brightly colored in this case. And this is a just, it's the same species, it's the offspring of the solitary version. And we don't hear about locust outbreaks happening in the US anymore, but they used to be a huge problem. So um, in the 1800s, the Rocky Mountain locusts devastated Midwestern agriculture on a regular basis, um, including um, there was a particularly bad outbreak from 1873 to 1877 that it was estimated to cause about two, $200 million in damage, which in today's money would be about $116 billion of a $217 billion industry. So almost more than half of U.S. ag was basically wiped out 
um, during this time period. People were starving in Minnesota and Nebraska because they had absolutely nothing to eat except for locusts. Um, and this, uh, with this, this history, the story was, is really, um, well, sort of this fascinating story is told by Jeffrey Lockwood in his book, uh, Locust, which I highly recommend if you are intrigued by this at all. So I'm looking at a map of, of where we're talking about, uh, we've got this sort of permanent zone. So this is where the grasshopper, the solitary version of that locust would sort of spend most of the time in the Rocky Mountains. And as they out would outbreak, they'd sort of move across and, and um, you know, extend all the way down into Texas and across to Nevada and sort of have this huge outbreak. Um, this map is based um, in from the 1880s, 1870s and 1880s. Uh, there was a commission that was gathered to try to understand these locusts to try to combat some of these outbreaks. More modern maps sort of show where these different outbreaks would occur um, in the 1850s. Uh, you see an, oh, oh dear. Oh no. Okay. My PowerPoint just collapsed. I'm so sorry. Uh, so in the 1850s, they were, uh, there was a big outbreak in the West. We had, uh, there were outbreaks sort of more uh, in the 1860s, sort of in the central region of the U.S. In the 1870s, um, they would, they moved sort of in 1873, they were sort of along a front um, from Nebraska down to Texas, and then sort of in 1874, it was it was everywhere. So um, we're talking about just just uh, there was es an estimate of something like 14 trillion locusts across the U.S. in these in these swarms. And uh, it it was devastating, and then. After the 1870 swarm, there weren't any outbreaks anymore. They're, they were gone. And, you know, people didn't realize what was happening at the time. They're like, I've got, we've got other problems. We can't deal with this right now. We don't, you don't really notice when something stops happening. But um, they, they never came back. And um, after, in about, about 50 years later, uh, entomologists began to realize, that's that's gone it's 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 it has gone extinct the rocky mountain locust went extinct so um jeffrey lockwood in his in his book um and in his career as a as an, an entomologist um sort of began investigating the rocky mountain locust and what happened to it and um found uh, went up to, into glaciers in the uh, in the Rockies and found sort of the remnants of the last hundred years of of locust outbreaks and was able to identify them as 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 extinct. But they're definitely not the same as some of the other um, species of grasshoppers that are in the area that are closely related. Um, and sort of put together this this idea about this hypothesis about what happened, which was that the, in the permanent zone here, um, can you see my screen? Probably not. The, oh, there it is. Fantastic. All right, in the permanent zone, um, this blue zone here, you can see my mouse a little bit, um, which is where they would spend the solitary phase of their locust cycle, their, of, their, of, their, of their life cycle, or not life cycle, but sort of generational cycle. Um, they were probably living in stream valleys that are sort of the right soil type for, for laying eggs. Um, and during the 1870s and 1880s, not eight, yeah, 1870s and 80s, uh, European colonizers were coming in and settling there and tilling and irrigating um, because it was quite, it was quite, there wasn't a lot of rain, but there was, were streams. So they were able to irrigate to, to, um, to sort of do agriculture. And by doing that, 
they were disrupting the uh, the solitary phase of those grasshoppers to the point where they disappeared. Because you can have a trillion locust outbreaks, but really you don't need that many solitary individuals to lead to that huge population. Now, you may have heard about locusts more recently in the news. Um, and year and 2020 was really uh, a year of, of plagues all over the place. Um, not just COVID, but um, locusts in across Eastern Africa, in Saudi Arabia, in um, Afghanistan, in in uh, Pakistan, all got uh, sort of the, the these these locusts, the desert locusts. 2000. This is because probably because in 2019 was the most active um, North Indian Ocean cyclone season ever recorded. And that led to huge amounts of water falling onto these, these pretty very dry deserts, um, leading to flooding and, uh, and all kinds of humanitarian problems, displaced people, all of that, but also resulting in a flush of green growth and lots and lots of plants kind of coming up and becoming green, which is great for the desert Locust grasshopper, the solitary phase, they started to come together, um, touching those little hairs and laying eggs. And all of a sudden, you've got these yellow grasshoppers that are locusts that are just eat everything in sight. Um, so, and we had water, you know, this flush of growth here, the, these locust groups, so these swarms. Um, are the are the, the the nymphs the young and we've got these huge huge groups of of um of locusts coming together across sort of smaller outbreaks smaller outbreaks as as we move farther north and farther west but it has been it was it's been a devastating devastating uh humanitarian issue the world bank um, last Mar April projected that the locust outbreak would cost about $8.5 billion. Um, it's uh, uh, potentially affecting 10% of the world's population. Um, these locust swarms could eat um, in a single day about the same amount of food as 35,000 people. And uh, I'm going to share a quick video just so you can see what this looks like in um uh share screen yeah uh in motion because it's it's really quite impressive so uh, it's just a five or six second video hope this works Ugh, no okay Okay, sorry. Oh, well. okay, we're gonna stop. Um, so you, you get an impression from this pic, the picture on the slide, that it's um, an amount of insects, an insect biomass that is just unbelievable if you've never experienced it. So. Uh, now that I've told you a few stories about Orthoptera, um, let's talk a little bit about identifying them. So there are a couple of characteristics that define Orthoptera. Um, the first is their wing. So, so insects have two pairs of wings. They have a, a, the sort of a, the front ones and the back ones. The front ones on Orthoptera, the four wings, have what's called tegmina, which means they're a little bit leathery. They're not sort of membranous and, and, and they're not as helpful for flying. So you can see that here, this leatheriness, again with the katydids, um, here you've got some of that leatheriness. It helps protect them. It allows some of them to have this, this camouflaging shape. Um, this is a mole cricket, goes underground, and is sort of protective. Um, another really important characteristic is a large pronotum. So this first segment on their abdomen behind their head is called pronotum. Uh, 
Um, they all have a large sort of shield-like shape right behind their head. They have um, jumping hind legs. So they've got these big femurs that have lots of muscles for jumping. Um, it's how they move, how they get away from predators, how they are able to chase prey. And they also have a well-developed ovipositor. And you can see that in a couple of these organisms. So for example, here, you can see that is an ovipositor. You can see the ovipositor on this Katie did, this kind of sorge coming out of the end of its abdomen, for example. Within the group, there are some, within the order, there are two suborders, or sort of two bigger groups of, of, of Orthoptera. We have the shorthorned, um, group, the Califera. Um, these are mostly grasshoppers. They have a uh, pretty short antenna, if not as long as their body. They're mostly active during the day. They rub their legs to produce those chirping sounds. And the other group is the Ancifera, or the longhorned Orthoptera, which are mostly nocturnal. They use crypsis, so they, they, they use camouflage to try to hide. Um, they're more likely to be omnivorous rather than um, herbivorous like the grasshoppers. They're, they'll eat more different kinds of, um, of organisms. They, sound, they make sound by rubbing their wings together. Um, so these are the crickets and katydids are examples of groups in the Ancifera. So if we um, sort of look at some of the families in each of these suborders, in Califera, or the shorthorned, group. We have the grasshoppers, the critidae. Um, we also have pygmy mole crickets, which are really tiny and cute. Um, they've got these big legs that are sort of interestingly curved. Um, and we have the pygmy grasshoppers, which uh, have a really long, pro this is all their pronotum. So this is one long piece and their wings are sitting down underneath that. Um, in the other suborder in the Ancifera, we have things like the katydids. Um, so katydids have sort of a sh sword-shaped um, ovipositor. They tend to have these um, sort of tent-like wings sitting on their body. Um, and, they, and they look often look, sort of have these intricate um, wing uh, tegmina that, that help them blend in. Crickets. Um, uh, have their wings that lay flat over their um, the ba their back. Uh, they have these really long antenna. Um, they're often often darkly colored. Although there's tree crickets in it as well that that have a similar you know they lay have their wings lay flat on their back, um, but they tend to be a little bit more delicate. And then we have the mole crickets, uh, the Griotalpidae, which have these really robust claws. And interestingly, the Gorilla Talpidae don't or have short antennae, but they are part of the suborder Ancifera. So um, some common species uh, in West Virginia, things like of, of grasshopper are things like the differential grasshopper. We've got the American bird grasshopper, um, the northern green striped grasshopper. Um, the Carolina grasshopper. So the differential grasshopper is actually in the same genus as the Rocky Mountain locust. Uh, for crickets, you might see tree crickets um, and field trick crickets. You can see that tree cricket is a much more delicate organism than a, than a field cricket, um, but, but you'll find it coming. It'll come to your porch lights and things like that. And then if you're digging around in your garden, you might see a nor Northern mole cricket um, is one of the few mole crickets that lives in the area. And then we have some katydid species that are pretty common. The northern bush katydid uh, will also come to your porch lights all the time. It's sort of this very leafy cricket um, blends in really well with leaves. You can also sometimes see pink ones. I have never seen one, but uh, I've seen pictures of them. They have there's a mutation that makes them pink. Um, and we've got the robust cone head. Uh, you can see that this the head of this one is is kind of a funny shape, and um, it looks like a cone, hence its name. All right, and this is my last slide. This is it I've got for the evening. Um, but there are some useful ID resources for you to use. 
um, online and uh, it's a book that uh, some books that might be of use. Um, the Orthoptera species file online has every Orthoptera species. It's got keys. If you're really get really into um, Orthoptera taxonomy, that's a really good resource. Bug guide is great. Um, in general, especially if you have a particular species that you're looking for and you want pictures of, um, there are a lot of um, experts who spend a lot of their time, going through their time and, and go through pictures and, and, and kind of help identify, especially if they're good pictures, what it is, sort of a resource in a, in a, in a community online that um, is great. Um, my first go-to often, if I don't know what something is, is the Seek app by iNaturalist. It uses machine learning to identify, so, you know, you take a picture and you can kind of figure out what it might be, you see some suggestions, and you can go look up more specifically what it is that you find. But it's, uh, it's a really fast way to, to, get, um, to get a good idea uh, of what something is. And then there are some books like the Field Guide to Grasshoppers and Katydids and Crickets of the United States. Um, I think it's a probably a really good resource too. Um, and that's it. That's all I've got for you. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, if, if I can. I know that that was kind of a technologically difficult at some points, but I'm hoping that um, I've intrigued you. You you recovered well. At least you didn't have your mute on. Here, here, I do have some questions. I'll put the first one up on the screen for you to read, for everyone to read and see what you think. Uh, uh, Dr. Krinsky briefly talked about convergent evolution happening in different species of insects in class one. How common is convergent evolution? You know, that is a really good question. It's not as uncommon as you would expect it to be, I feel like. I can't give you any numbers as to like how often it happens, but uh, there are a lot of examples of things sort of either gaining similar attributes or losing them. Um, you know, talking about uh, uh, really, so, so for example, I can give you an example on milkweeds. Milkweed, has really toxic chemicals, these cardenoloids, that um, anything that's feeding on them needs to be able to eat. And there's a few risks, because they're, they're, they're neurotoxins, well, they're, I think they're neurotoxins, they, there's a few receptors that you need to either turn on or turn off to be able to feed on them. And there are all kinds of different organisms. So monarch butterflies, milkweed bugs, aphids, um, leaf miners and other things that have this, these particular receptors turned on or off. And there's only so many tweaks that you can make separately to, um, to, to, to deal with with these cardenoloids. So there are, they, the, the mutations have arisen in the same locations in completely unrelated insects. So that would be an example of convergent evolution, but because they're trying to deal, it's like chemically, there's only so much you can, it, that is possible to, to change these really conserved areas of, of, of the brain of the, of the nervous system. Okay, here's another question. Uh, and I think you mentioned one of the locusts was extinct. Yeah, are there any insects heading toward extinction? Absolutely, there are a ton. And because we don't know what they are, we will never know if they lived or not. Um, there are a few insects that have been identified as on the endangered species list. And there are not that many insects that get onto the endangered species list um, because they're not charismatic enough, we don't know enough, it's hard to measure insect populations. So the American burying beetle is on the endangered species list. There are some, there are some butterflies, uh, some, some butterflies that have really close symbiotic relationships with ants that get put on the list and have gone extinct in the last 
you know, 50 years. Yeah. Um, let's see. We, I know we have a few more here. Let's see. Uh, the, the question about oxygen, you mentioned the large insects. There is less oxygen now. The, the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere is now like 20, 21% um, compared to the 35. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. How about this? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, there's a couple of things that have happened. Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff that's happened. Um, it's being able to study DNA has changed what we know about who's related to who, because the morphological features don't necessarily tell you the whole story. And, and the DNA is better at telling you the whole story um, generally. Uh, there is particularly conserved sequences of DNA that are associated with ribosomes. So they don't change very much and you can measure how many sort of, and the mutations accumulate sort of over time but they're not actually coding for any DNA. So it's a really good sort of clock for how long ago, if, if they share a certain percentage of those sequences, it tells you sort of how long ago they diverged. So you can tell, you can identify how long ago something was similar. You can also use that, that region of sequences to go into a bird's digestive system into poop into um you know the soil and figure out how many sort of species of insects how much dna from different insects was is in there so you get a sense you can get a sense of the ecology as well as the history okay and here's a sort of follow-up question about uh, symbiotic relationships do symbiotic relationships occur naturally along the same lines as convergent evolution? Um, I'm not sure what you mean here. Uh, symbiotic relationships evolve and uh, can be positive and negative and one or both parties either benefit or one may not benefit. Um, they do often have to have particular, um, you, you know, changes, particular adaptations to be able to form these symbiote, to be able to be related in these ways um, and, and spend their lives together. Okay, one more. Uh about monarch butterflies, I think. Yeah, as far as we know, it is. Um, yep, <laughs> as far as we know. Yeah, sadly. Um, I had a question earlier and, and it kind of leads into what we're talking about next week. Why are there, why so many beetles, do you think? Um, well, oh. beetles, are uh, they're associated with they, they, so there's I have I have some some theories I don't know if that sort of drives with what the literature or you know general science would say the they have these really hard elytra these these the wing covers which means that they can go in they're sort of less fragile than other groups. Um, I don't know why they would be less, more or less abundant than say hymenoptera. I think there's some debate over whether or not they're more diverse than hymenoptera now because of all these parasitic wasps, you know, so these parasitic mm -hmm. wasps that are very specialized on one particular insect and stuff. Uh, yeah, when I was a kid, I always thought I discovered new species and I couldn't find them in my field guide. <laughs> Is there a way now, like somebody finds a, you showed us a website where you can sort of take a picture and, and plug it in there. Um, well, so the trick with a lot of these beetles is that you have to dissect out their, 
their reproductive organs to be able to identify. It's actually true with the grasshoppers too. Like the, the reason it was so hard to understand if the Rocky Mountain locust was extinct is because a lot of the, the morphology is actually just in the, the, the reproductive um, organs of the, the, these, the, the males. So it's hard to like identify them species. All right, fair enough. Thank you very much for a very informative program and a very interesting one. And um, yeah, let's- Thank you uh, so much ahead. for organizing this. I've been really enjoying it and I'm gonna to continue to come. Great, <laughs> yeah, we're, gonna, we're gonna fire some beetle questions at, at Dr. Evans next week, so. I think that's a good idea. See what he knows. Um, so let's draw our winners for the evening. Oh, Vivian, okay. Here we go. We're, we're giving away two t-shirts, brood PU t-shirts or tote bags. You choose. So the first winner is, and I always mind these up too tightly and I can't get them open. Okay. Sharon Slocan. Sharon, you asked about the monarch butterflies. You've won a t-shirt. And the other winner is Andrea Allen, who made a comment. She has a, a cricket that comes in her apartment and is so loud she can't sleep. And, I uh, lived in an apartment with crickets under the carpet for a long time. It was very nice. nice. So, so a lot of nice comments there. and people thanking you. And uh, I encourage you to look at the Facebook page and maybe you can answer some of the questions there. Sure. If I, if I missed any. Uh, okay, so next week, as I mentioned, Dr. Evans, Beatles, an inordinate fondness there uh, for... And uh, Dr. Grayling will be with us Tuesday at lunch with books, uh, philosophy. So philosophy and Beatles in the same week. Makes sense. And oh, I also want to mention that on July 6th, one of our slots open at lunch with books. So we're going to do uh, one of our staff members, Nate, is a big fan of Manises and has raised them uh, for a long time. So he's going to do a little program on Manises. And uh, we're going to actually keep one in an, an aquarium that we're trying to make into a vivarium at the library. And we're going to have a camera. So we'll have our own, own uh, insect zoo, only we'll have only mantises in it. And that's coming, so stay tuned. And uh, thanks, uh, Elizabeth, again, for a great program. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight. We will see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.